Good evening, ghoulies and ghosties and long-legged beasties. This is Alex, coming at you from the underworld, and welcome back to another episode of... As you can see, I did a thing. And the reason why is because I'm not going to be at work for the next week and a half, and through the whole coronavirus scare, I mean you might as well make lemonade out of lemons, and that's what I did with this. I haven't had a mohawk since I was in my early 20s, and I decided, hey, what better time than now? So that's what I'm rocking. And uh, anyway, I plan to have it for the entire time that I'm off work. But of course, when I go back to work, if it hasn't grown out on the sides by then, I'm gonna have to buzz this off and just start with a clean slate, but I'm hoping it'll grow out enough where I don't have to do that. But uh, anyway, if you're watching this and you're having to self-isolate because of the coronavirus, I hope that this entertains you. And if you are feeling sick, I hope that you feel better soon. So nothing but positive vibes from me to you. And let's just hope that all of this blows over so we can have a pint down at the pub. But now that I have that out of the way, I do want to go on and start discussing what we can expect from this weekend's video, which in the last video I did, I said that this month I'm reserving all reviews for books that have been recommended to me by my viewers. And the book that I'm reviewing is When Darkness Loves Us by Elizabeth Ingstrom. And this was recommended to me by my good friend and kindred spirit, Sayla Janelle, which we've known each other now for, oh God, 10 years, I think. And we have done conventions together. We used to podcast together. And she's just this all around chipper, happy go lucky person. And the thing is, she reads some of the most messed up crap on the face of the planet. And I know that when Sayla recommends for me to read a book, it is going to be disturbing. So when she recommended I read When Darkness Loves Us, I was instantly happy because I just simply knew that this was going to be something that broke apart the monotony of just chills and scares and just provide me with something bleak and nihilistic. And of course, I wasn't wrong with assuming this. When Darkness Loves Us is extremely disturbing, and it's something that I absolutely adored. So for my sick sister out there, Sayla, thank you so much for recommending this book to me. It was just what I needed, and I'm glad that I finally had the opportunity to sit down and read this because I plan on reading more disturbing books that you've recommended to me. So I hope you enjoy this review, and I hope that you're doing well. When Darkness Loves Us by Elizabeth Ingstrom is one of the paperbacks from Hell, and with this book we do have two stories. Now, the first story is called When Darkness Loves Us, and it focuses on the character by the name of Sally Ann, and she has recently married an older guy by the name of Michael, and they are currently living with her parents on their family property, which is nothing but farmland. And so, just good old country living, that's the setting of this place. Well, their goal is to eventually build a house on that property, move out from her parents, and move into that home where they can start their own family. And this one fateful day, as Michael is doing farm work on the property in his tractor, Sally Ann is kind of exploring the woods nearby. And she comes across this tunnel that she used to play in as a kid. And the tunnel does have some doors and a latch on those doors on top of it, so that if there are kids nearby, they won't go down in there and get lost. Well, she opens up the doors, goes down into the tunnel, and she's getting all nostalgic and everything. And it never really says why the tunnel is there to start with, but Sally Ann does speculate that maybe this is where slaves would hide back in the day. Well, while she's down there, Michael stops his work and he's coming her way and she thinks that this would be the perfect time to scare him. So she hides and she waits for him to come closer and he has no clue she's down there. Well, before she can jump out, he slams the door shut, locks him, and then goes on about his business. And by the time he's on his tractor, she's already screaming, but no one can hear her. 
So she thinks, okay, well, I'm just going to hang out by the doors and people are going to realize I'm missing. Michael's going to realize these doors were open and they're going to check here. Well, even though that sounds like a good plan, there's a lake nearby underground and she starts hearing all of these really bizarre sounds come from that lake. And it scares her to, to the point where she takes refuge deeper inside of the earth, which she discovers that this is a whole subterranean underworld that she's now lost in. And if you don't think that's bad enough, the next thing she realizes is she's two months pregnant. And if that's not bad enough, what happens after that is nothing but a domino effect of pure horror. And it builds to this really just horrific ending that I'm still trying to wrap my brain around. The second story in this book is called Beauty Is, and it focuses on the character by the name of Martha, who is about 50 years old. And with Martha, she was born with a hole in her face where no should have been, and she's also mentally handicapped. Now, on the cover of this book, this character here is a reference to the Martha character. And with this story, it is told in a non-linear format, so we're learning about the past so we can understand the present. And what we learn is that her parents, who were named Fern and Harry, her mother, Fern, was an actual faith healer. So if she laid her hands on a sick individual, she could heal that individual. And she really believes that this was a gift from God, and she believes that God is love, and she's carrying out the gift that God gave her to use. Well, Harry is really this fire and brimstone dude, and he's telling her that God is not a loving God, he is wrathful, and because of her tampering with God's will, they are going to feel his wrath. Well, of course, Martha is born, and she's born deformed, and Harry thinks that this is their punishment for what Fern has been doing. Well, as the story progresses, we see that Martha was not born mentally handicapped. However, a very traumatic event happens in Martha's life, and when Fern lays her hands on Martha, she discovers an evil has entered into her brain, which has caused her to become mentally handicapped. And as the story progresses as a slow burn, you really have an ending that is just almost out of nowhere, much as with when the story of When Darkness Loves Us comes into play, we're seeing a horrific deal that stretched out from the first page to the last page. With this one, it's a slow burn, and it is just as crazy at the end as the previous story. When Darkness Loves Us was inspired by a simple visit to Disneyland. Here, Ingstrom rode the 20,000 leagues under the sea ride, and once on it, she suffered a panic attack. She has previously explained, suddenly, there wasn't enough air for me and everyone else, and I wanted to claw my way out. This is when she considered what would happen if she were trapped underground and pregnant, which served as the plot of When Darkness Loves Us. After submitting the finished product to Theodore Sturgeon's workshop, he helped her find an agent who asked her to include a second novella with this work. There had been a request for a third novella to be included, but Ingstrom was happy with the two combined stories, which brings us to the story Beauty Is. Ingstrom said Beauty Is was based on an actual event while she lived in Hawaii where a mentally disabled woman was harassed by a group of men, where eventually they lured her to a bar and took advantage of her. Fun facts! Now, before I get on to talking about Elizabeth Ingstrom, I would just like to note that one of my reference pieces was this book, Monster She Wrote. This is a fantastic work that gives you information about some of your favorite female horror authors, and it totally gives up some great recommendations for authors that you can go out and include with your library. So I highly recommend this, and this is about the third time I've referenced this book, as the first time it was when I did the book review for the Woman in Black by Susan Hill, and the second time was when I reviewed Don't Look Now by Daphne du Maurier, which both of those reviews are available on this channel, so be sure to check those out and definitely give this book a shot. 
And also, as I had mentioned, When Darkness Loves Us is a part of the paperbacks from Hell book. And if you don't have a copy of this, you totally need to get it because it is full of nothing but just vintage book information and author information. And you get a lot of really cool backstory and insight on the publishing business with the horror genre from like the 60s all the way up through the 90s. So I totally recommend this as well. But enough about that, so let's find out a little bit more about Elizabeth Ingstrom. Born as Betty Lynn Gutzmer, Ingstrom moved to Hawaii from Illinois, and after working in advertising and owning her own agency in Maui, she decided on joining a writer's workshop under the Hugo Award-winning author Theodore Sturgeon. In 1992, Ingstrom received a Stoker Award nomination for Best Short Story Collection, also, her story titled Crossley was featured in the 13th annual collection of the year's best fantasy and horror. On the side, Ingstrom works with the non-denominational program known as Love and Mercy Ministries. Also, Ingstrom's pen name is constructed of her husband's last name and her daughter's middle name. Now that we have those bases covered, I would like to go on to the spoiler section of this video. And pretty much this is going to be where I reveal a few things that could ruin the experience for you if you've not read this book yet. So if you wish to skip this section, just scroll down to the comments section of this video. You'll see that I have a pinned comment with a timestamp in it. If you click that timestamp, it will direct you away from the spoiler section and bring you over to to the thoughts category. Now you only have 13 seconds to do this. So ready, set, go. Now that everyone has had a chance to click away, I want to talk about some of the scenes in this that absolutely just shocked the hell out of me, and I did not see them coming by any means. Now, the first moment where I really feel like I was yanked out of my comfort zone was when I realized Sally Ann was going to be trapped in the tunnels for the long haul. And so the author has already established within me some emotions where I do not feel easy at all. Well, she decides to up the ante here and starts adding in some gross outs, such as she describes the way Sally Ann survives down there is she eats slugs, and then when she gives birth to Clint, she ends up saving her placenta and afterbirth aside so she can eat that too. Well, as the story is progressing, uh, Clint has grown into a young man and uh, Sally Ann estimates that this has only been eight years where she and her son have been down here. And what's kind of disturbing about this, well, there's no kind of to it, it's sick as hell, uh, she continues to let Clint breastfeed off of her, which I guess under the circumstance, this is his opportunity to like get calcium in his body. But anyway, it's still disturbing. So she has the epiphany that one day she is going to die and Clint is going to be left down here. So she finally gets the gumption to escape and she succeeds at doing so. And it's a long, hard road of hell for her to actually get out of there, but she does. Now, while she is gone trying to get help for her and Clint, she ends up uh, getting back with her mother and sister where they take her in and they nurse her back a little bit and stuff but her father has died at this point and her little sister has married her husband Michael. Well, while she's discovering all this, Clint is still underground and he has a resentment that's building towards his mom and this is where it gets really messed up and you can totally see that he is a psychopath. Oh, and by the way, she actually discovers they've been down there for 20 years, not 8 years. So that's 20 years where this guy has been sucking on her breasts. So that makes it even creepier. But he imagines, and this is to relieve himself, he imagines beating his mother. And while he imagines beating her, he's masturbating over it. And then when that doesn't help him anymore, he goes to the lakes underground and starts getting the fish out that they've been eating during this time as well. And he starts torturing the hell out of the fish. And so you totally see that this is the makings of a true psychopath. It's, it's just... Charlie Manson, eat your heart out. 
So while Sally Ann is up uh, in the world, she discovers that she is being shunned now. The life, a life has continued without her, and she is no longer really welcome there because her mom and sister do not want her to mess up what uh, her sister has established with her husband, Michael. Well, what she decides to do is she decides to kidnap her niece, which is a little girl in her single digits. So she kidnaps this little girl and takes her into the tunnels. They go deep into the earth where Clint is, and she just gives this little girl over to Clint. And as soon as she's old enough to start birthing babies for Clint, that's exactly what she starts doing. And then the ending of this story is just it's a it's a mind melt. It's just, damn, the author went there. Because at the end of this, you have where Clint has decided he wants to start a clan of his own underground. And so he decides he's going to start going out, getting females, dragging them back down into the tunnels where they will bear his children and he will have a large family. And... I mean, if that ain't nightmare fuel, I don't know what is, because truth be it, I, I can't think of anything worse than being in a tight spot, in the dark, no light whatsoever, and then being like the mother of this insane person's babies. It, that's, I can't think beyond that. That's just messed up. Beauty Is is just as disturbing as the predecessor story in this book, but with this story, Ingstrom really reserves all of the disturbing moments for the end finale, rather than having them stretch from beginning to end, such as what she did with When Darkness Loves Us. Now, the moment that really disturbed me here is the scene where Fern has had to leave the home at the moment so she can go tend to some victims who were in a wreck and try to heal them. Well, when she returns, she discovers Martha is nowhere to be seen. And when she tries to get help from her husband, Harry, he's just very nonchalant about it. And you can tell he's totally guilty about something. Well, after searching around the property, she finally goes to the barn, and with this barn, Harry has told Martha time and time again never to go into the barn. And when Fern gets in there, it's just, oh, it, it's heavy. It's really heavy because she finds Martha naked, and she has been hidden under a hay bale, and whatever has happened to Martha has been so traumatizing that it has prevented her from being able to ever mentally advance beyond this moment. And what's even worse is you have where she has just returned from having face surgery. Martha has just had a nose made onto her face to cover the hole that has been there. And so you have all of these traumatic elements that have come together for this poor child, and it's something that's just totally heart wrenching. Well, as the story progresses, you discover that when Martha had gone into the barn, she had seen her father butt naked, covered in blood, and he had killed a double-headed calf. And the reason why he killed this calf is because it was born deformed, and he has a hatred for anything that appears unnatural or deformed, uh, such as his daughter. And anyway, what we know from this moment is he puts the dead calf in a grave that he's buried. He stripped Martha naked and then thrown her on top of the dead calf. And he's taunted her like he's going to kill her and bury her alive. And then I tend to think so much more has happened beyond what was written here. And Unfortunately, my mind went to the worst case scenario, which if you have ever been afraid for a child or concerned for a child's well-being, you can imagine what the worst case scenario is here. And it's much worse than what was written in the book. And the thing is, it really made me just absolutely hate this man. It made me want to just... <sighs> I'll talk about it more in the tea time segment. But anyway... As the story progresses, what I found to be surprising is Martha remains in this um, state of mind where she is unable to ever advance. And people in town, they call her names like retard and stuff. And these are the people who are just the scum of the earth individuals, which is only like maybe one or two of those. 
and everyone else for the majority of it takes care of her. However, Martha does have a person who she has hired to help around the house, and his name is Leon. And Leon actually does fall in love with Martha to a degree. And once Leon starts to love Martha, Martha is able to grow beyond her uh, wisdom. She's able to start reading, spelling. She's able to become an independent person and just be able to flourish as a strong-willed woman. And then once another tragic event happens to her, the story ends where, and I saw this coming from about a mile away, the story ends where she ends up cutting off Priscilla's nose and she sews it onto her own face, which I thought that was just completely messed up and I loved how it played out. But what ended up becoming even sadder to me was the fact that after this traumatic event happened, she regressed back in to being mentally stunted. And so that was really interesting to see how love had helped her develop and then hatred had taken that development away. So I really feel like that was something where the disturbing factors of this really played in a great deal and they were necessary to see how it played into the character. When Elizabeth Ingstrom wants to create an asshole character, she knows how to do it. And the thing is, like in the story, When Darkness Loves Us, this is a messed up situation to start with, and no one does anything to make it any better. And what I mean by this is after Sally Ann gets out from the tunnels and she is back at home with her mom and in a family setting and stuff, her mom and her sister uh, Maggie, they continue to treat her like a dark secret. And the reason why is because Maggie here, as soon as Sally Ann went missing, she jumped on Michael's meat pole, married him, and shot out four kids. Well, no one wants to mess that up, so what they do is they keep the fact from Michael that his first wife has returned to them. And that's just messed up because he has a right to know. Even if it is going to cause some turmoil, he has a right to know and to receive some closure. And so this is just selfish on the behalf of the mother and Maggie. And it's, it, as I said, it's a messed up situation. But I do think that had they treated Sally Ann differently, then we might would have had a different outcome than what happened. And... You know, I understand that Sally Ann is scorned and she feels hurt and neglected and everything because of how they're treating her. And this does not give her the excuse to kidnap her niece named Mary and then serve up Mary to her psychotic ass son as nothing but a little sex slave. That's screwed up too. This is the two wrong turns don't make a right situation. And there's nothing consecutively good in this story. From beginning to end, not one single good thing happens and it's all because of the decisions made by human beings that we are brought to this bleak place. Now, in the second story, Beauty Is, if there was ever one character who needed the ever-loving living hell beat out of him, it was the douche canoe dad named Harry. And the thing is, okay, Harry is like, God is a wrathful God. And that's enough for me to not like him already, because the thing is, in life, I've met quite a few people who have said God is a wrathful God. And instead of trying to treat everyone with love and compassion, they treat them as shitty as they possibly can. And so that's enough right there for me not to like him. Also, he calls his own daughter a retard. He also does things to her that uh, just try traumatize her for life. And even though he calls himself a good Christian person who fears God, he is honestly a piece of shit. And, you know, the thing is with Fern here, she preaches that God is love, and that's awesome. I can totally get behind that. God is love, and that is it. That is good. Don't be an asshole to one another. That's what my philosophy is. And that's what I think God would want us to do, is just simply say, don't be an asshole to one another. Well, you know, even though she has that philosophy, 
I so would have kicked that son of a bitch husband in the ass so hard that my foot would have went up there and he'd still be sucking on my toes to this day, let me tell you. To quote my good friend Sayla, Ingstrom is queen. And she and I just got off the phone talking about this book again a few minutes ago, and we were talking about how this was something that neither of us had bargained for. And as far as myself is concerned, I honestly did not think this book was going to go as dark as what it did because it kind of parades around with its synopsis as being like a drama or suspense. But this is full-fledged horror, and it is domesticated horror at that. It brings us right into the home setting where horror is birthed with the family. And it, it just, it's something that never lets up. It's very psychological, and after reading it, you at least need to have a day or two where you can just process everything you've read. And the best way I can sum this up is, it's like an amped up version of V.C. Andrews. And until I read this book, I honestly thought Andrews was the queen of domesticated horror. No, <laughs> it is Elizabeth Ingstrom, in my opinion. After reading this book, this is just something that it, it it's mind-blowing. It honestly is. And especially with the commentary that comes with it, I think it's the commentary that makes me love this so much. And the thing is, with some of the commentary, especially in When Darkness Loves Us, the uh, messages that I saw was being able to examine an individual who has the will to survive and also the will to adapt. But also it does show us how a person could be after they have been in solitude and then they entered the real world again, kind of like a prisoner who's been in confinement and then they're introduced to the world after it's changed for about 20 years. And so that was something really interesting to be able to see and discuss in that angle. And as far as the story is concerned, beauty is, you do have a lot of commentary that comes with it as well. And I'm trying to do this where I'm not revealing any spoilers. But with beauty is, you see the argument between God is love versus God is wrathful. So that can open up quite a few debates right there. But also another uh, theme that comes into play is how when a person is loved, they are able to grow. But when a person is shunned or belittled, they are stunted from their growth. So that was something that I totally picked up on in that story. And I will admit, this book is not going to be for everyone. This is a heavy read. This is something that is dark and gritty, and I really think that if you're not in a good headspace when you read this, especially a good headspace where you might have come from an abusive family, mentally or physically, this might not be the book for you at this time. But do know that it is a phenomenal read, and it is something that I just... I've not encountered something of this caliber in so few pages before. I highly recommend When Darkness Loves Us by Elizabeth Ingstrom. And even though I've not read any of her other books at the moment, I can wholeheartedly say that this is a great first read by this author. And I know for a fact that I'm going to read some of her other books in the near future. As a matter of fact, I already have on my library shelf Black Ambrosia, which even though that is a vampire story, I I've heard good things about it, and if that is anything such as what she's pulled off with this book, I know it's going to be good. So we'll return to that after I read it in the near future. But for now, I highly recommend this. It's available in print, ebook, and audio, so it's not hard to get your hands on a copy. On to the questions. My first question is, what is a horror book that you would recommend where it is a domesticated horror story? Meaning, I want a horror story that takes place in a family setting or at the home. So load up my comments with those suggestions. And my second question is, were you or are you now afraid of the dark and why? Uh, I'm not afraid of the dark anymore, even though I will admit that if I watch, like, some true crime stuff, it makes me want to sleep with a shotgun by my bed, 
But other than that, I'm pretty comfortable with the dark. Now, when I was a kid, though, the dark scared the hell out of me. And it wasn't because I expected some monster or ghost to be lurking in the darkness. It's just that I was really afraid where if I were to have gone outside, then maybe there was someone lurking nearby that could have done something to me. And I really attribute that fear to watching, like, Unsolved Mysteries. So that was my main reason why. And then when I became a teenager and I got close to me uh, driving and stuff like that, one of my greatest fears was having to drive alone at night because I was like, what would happen if my car broke down? And also this was like uh, when cell phones were kind of getting popular, like you were lucky to have a good signal. And the phone I had was like this old Nash Bridges phone and it was crap. It could only store like two numbers. And so my phobia was what if I broke down on the side of the road and the person who helped me out ended up being an individual who had malicious intent. So I was more so afraid of what other human beings could do to me rather than something fictional. And uh, as I continued to grow, I would say in my late teens, I had become a little bit more adjusted with the idea that not everyone was out to get me. And so I started doing these midnight walks, and it actually became very relaxing. And from time to time, I do still like to walk at night, so that's something that I have yet to grow out of. But just uh, load up the comments. I'm interested to hear what you have to say, and uh, also be sure to recommend some books to me as well. Well, with that covered, it is time to wrap up the video, and I would like to say thank you to Joseph Baylot, Lisa G, and J.L. Mulvihill, and I'm saying thank you to these wonderful people because they have contributed to my Patreon account, which if you would like to contribute to my Patreon as well, just go to the description section of this video and you'll have a link available so you can donate to my Patreon. And for $5 a month, I'll give you a shout out at the end of all of my videos. And for $10 a month, I'll give you that same shout out, but once a month, I'll send you over a piece of my photography as a thank you. And it will be creepy photography, so so don't expect little happy kittens and butterflies and stuff. But um, if you are able to contribute, thank you. That's awesome. If you're not able to contribute, no sweat. All I ask is that you continue to return to my channel and just enjoy yourself here. That's all I'm asking. And if you would like to connect with me on social media like Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, links to all of those are available in the description section as well. So feel free to hit me up on one of those social media sites. And until we see each other again, I hope you have a great week. I hope that you remain safe. And I hope that if you are under the weather, that you continue to improve. So until we see each other again, have a great week and sweet nightmares.